Meanwhile, literally today, Britain is, is boiling its own totally different kettle of fish um, that will have profound implications for Theresa May, for the British government, and for that country's relationship with us and every other country on earth. Today was the first day of voting in the UK and in the Netherlands in the European elections that are happening over the next four days. UK and the Netherlands vote today. Uh, tomorrow, it's Ireland and the Czech Republic. On Saturday, it's Latvia, Malta, and Slovakia. And then on Sunday, it's the other 21 European countries, uh, other 21 countries in the European Union. Now, these elections happen once every five years. These are elections to fill seats in the European Parliament, which has 751 seats. There's going to be hundreds of millions of people voting over these four days. It looks like what we are likely to see as results from this voting is a whole bunch of far-right, anti-immigrant, and fundamentally anti-European parties doing very well in these elections, which ironically will fill the European Parliament. Their idea is that they will hopefully destroy it from within. You may remember back in 2016 how the Brexit referendum in the UK happened just a few months before our presidential election that year, that, that shocking result of that referendum where British voters defied the polls and narrowly voted to pull up all the drawbridges and, and saw Britain off from Europe, even though they really had absolutely no idea what that would mean or how they would do it. That Brexit vote in the summer of 2016 was a, a global shock. At, at the time for us as Americans, it was shocking. In, in retrospect, I think we now look back at that vote from the summer of 2016 and recognize that when, when just a few months later in that same year, November of that same year, when our own polls proved wrong, when Donald Trump was all, all of a sudden elected president of all people, I think now looking back with the advantage of, of both hindsight and a wide angle lens, it seems at least plausible that that Brexit vote in the summer of 2016 was a little bit of a harbinger for what was coming our way just a few months later in the fall of 2016. Well, now here we are again with these European elections starting today. And we are seeing that dynamic that we saw at work in the Brexit election in 2016 and in the Trump election that fall. We are seeing that dynamic not only not reversed, we're seeing it accelerated in some ways even as it is still being ham-handedly supported by some of the same external forces whose nefarious aims are by now quite clear and easy to see. I mean, in the UK specifically, they literally just formed a party called the Brexit Party. And in these European Parliament elections where Brits voted today, the Brexit Party is considered likely to win the most votes. And, and again, these votes are for the European Parliament. It's not for the British Parliament. But ultimately, after today, if it's going to be the Brexit party representing the UK in Europe, well, the already teetering Theresa May government back home in London that already can't handle the Brexit process, either to stop it or go through with it or find some half measure middle way through it, that Brexit party election to the European Parliament is going to give Theresa May's government in London a really hard shove. It's, it's worth watching what's about to happen in Britain. It's also just worth, worth watching overall over these next few days. I mean, particularly because we Americans are still living through our own ongoing drama from 2016. I mean, just look at what we're going through this week. Look at what we're going through these last couple of months. We have now had 63 straight days in Washington of what amounts to total breakdown, total stonewall, total all-out brawling in Washington since Mueller's investigation was ended 63 days ago, since Mueller's report on what happened in our 2016 election and what happened with that Russian interference effort was submitted to the Trump administration and then submarined, and we've never heard from Robert Mueller since. I mean, we are still right now, day-to-day, -day, living through our own drama of our own bizarre 2016 election right now and what happened with those external factors to influence it. Well, this European election that's happening right now as we speak is a variation on the theme of what we went through. This is the same patterns, the same dynamic at work. Sometimes I think it's even easier to see that pattern when it happens to another country in, instead of your own. And it's sometimes easier to see when it's really freaking dramatic. You got a sense of how dramatic this was all going to be when we saw how this week of this big vote kicked off this week in, the, in Europe. Um, can we, and I know this is a little bit weird, but can we just talk about Austria for a second? Um, <laughs> whether or not you think you care about Austria, just trust me. This is, it's worth learning what just happened in Austria because once you learn it, you are going to want to tell somebody else this story. Like in a bar this weekend or at the water cooler at work or over a campfire or on a long elevator ride. Like you're going to want to tell this story. 
It, but it really happened. And it's just happened in the past few days. All right. So Austria's in the European Union. They're one of the countries that is voting on Sunday, I think, is their vote. Uh, their chancellor is this guy who, yes, looks like it's take your baby chancellor to work day. Um, he is 32 <laughs> years old. Uh, he won in 2017 the top job in the Austrian government when his center-right government got the most votes in the election that year. Uh, but although his party got the most votes, they didn't get enough votes to actually form a government on their own. And so the young chancellor had to decide what other entity in the Austrian government he would go into coalition with in order to form a majority that would then run that country. And the young chancellor from the center-right party decided he would look around and pick who he wanted to form a coalition with, and he decided to pick the party that was founded by the ex-Nazis. Now, I do not mean that as an insult. That is not like some ad hominem hyperbolic attack. I mean, we're talking about Austria here, so high on a hill, there's a lone leak. I mean, this is a party that was, a, this is a party that was actually founded by actual ex-Nazis, real Nazis, just speaking factually. Uh, the party founded by the ex-Nazis is called the Freedom Party. And it's interesting. Um, the government of Russia, Vladimir Putin, and his political party in Russia have taken a keen interest in supporting the Freedom Party in Austria. Uh, the year before the Freedom Party, this group founded by ex-Nazis, the, the year before they were invited to join Austria's coalition government and help form the government in that nation, the top official of Austria's Freedom Party was invited to Moscow to sign a cooperation agreement with Vladimir Putin's party, with, with United Russia, which is Putin's party. Uh, then the following year was when that Freedom Party official got into the Austrian government. He became the vice chancellor of Austria, the number two guy in the whole government. And that raised all sorts of interesting questions as to what the impact would be of that party taking power in Austria while having a formal cooperation agreement with Vladimir Putin's party in Moscow. I mean, as part of the, the coalition deal, that center-right young chancellor joined with the Freedom Party in order to form a majority together. The Freedom Party got half the cabinet agencies, including like the foreign minister and the defense minister. They got control of the nation's intelligence services. Western intelligence agencies were so freaked out by that, they stopped sharing intelligence with the Austrian intelligence agencies because they just assumed that once these Freedom Party guys got a hold of anything sensitive that might be of interest to Moscow, these Austrian guys would just ship it straight to Putin so we could have a look at it. They stopped sharing intel with the Austrian government. And now all along, the young chancellor in Austria who decided to partner with these guys, he has had to defend the fact that he went into coalition with these guys. You know, he's had to defend them every time they come out with some new racist statement, some new anti-Semitic trope. He's had to defend them uh, shutting down all the monitoring and law enforcement actions against neo-Nazis in Austria, which is what happens when you put the ex-Nazis in, in, in charge of the agencies that were supposed to be doing these things. I mean, the young chancellor has gone out of his way, particularly when talking to the international press, to, to say that he doesn't worry at all about the links between the Freedom Party and Russia. He's gone out of his way to say the links between the Freedom Party, his governing partners in Russia, that's all overblown. Well, on Friday, this past week, two news organizations published this video, which, there we go, which shows uh, the vice chancellor of Austria, the number two guy in that government. He's the head guy of the Freedom Party. That's him on the right side of your screen with the sort of wide neck shirt and the creepy wristband thing. Um, the other guy on the left side of the screen standing up, he's another Freedom Party official. In this video, he functions as the sort of translator here because he speaks sort of elementary school level Russian. And the blonde lady who you see there whose face is pixelated she is posing in this interaction as the niece of a Russian oligarch who would like to support the Freedom Party. That's who these Freedom Party guys think she is. She's visiting from Russia with a whole bunch of money to spend to help them out. And in this video, which stretches for seven hours, the vice chancellor of Austria, the guy in the front of the screen here, head of the Freedom Party, this guy from this group founded by ex-Nazis, who they elevated to the number two person in that government, he chats with this young woman about what he wants from her uncle, what he wants from a Kremlin-connected Russian oligarch 
to support his party and to support his political aspirations. He tells this woman that this Russian oligarch should use Russian money to take control of the biggest tabloid newspaper in Austria, turn that tabloid into a mouthpiece for the Freedom Party, help them get elected. Once they get control of the government, the Russian oligarch should then form a construction company. And then this guy, who will be then running the government, will make sure that all the road building contracts, all the big infrastructure contracts in Austria would then go to the new construction company secretly set up for that purpose and run by the Russian oligarch who spent all that money to get the ex-Nazi party in charge. So you pay for us to get in power, we will pay you. You infiltrate our country and our press on behalf of Russia. You install a Kremlin-friendly far-right political party in, in Austria. And once we're in there, we'll pay you back with cash, with public contracts. Win, win, win. It's all spelled out. The video was published on Friday. Uh, The vice chancellor of Austria, the guy with the wide neck T-shirt and the creepy wristband, uh, he resigned the next day on Saturday. Number two official in the government. Two days later on Monday, the interior minister, who's also a Freedom Party guy, he was fired by the chancellor after he expressed not that much interest in pursuing this as a potentially criminal matter. In response, all of the other Freedom Party ministers said they would quit too. And yesterday they all did. That's half the ministers in the government, including the defense minister and the labor minister and the foreign minister who invited Putin to her wedding. And so the Austrian government just collapsed. They have to call snap elections. Nobody knows what's going to happen. But it's happened literally on the eve of the European elections. And now we're about to find out how well that Freedom Party, that exact same party, is going to do in the European parliamentary elections when Austrians get their turn to vote in those elections on Sunday. They've been favored to do very well. How will they do now that all of their ministers have just left the government and the government has collapsed over them being exposed to try to sell out their government to Russian oligarchs? I mean, sometimes exposing Russian influence over a political campaign leads to the collapse of you're like, the whole government. It's amazing, right? It can happen. Um, but this, this dynamic is, is, is at large now, right? It's not just one country. In addition to that cooperation agreement that Putin's political party uh, signed with the Freedom Party in, Aux- in Austria, Putin's political party did the exact same kind of agreement with the right-wing ascendant political party in Italy, which is called the League. The League is poised to win tons of seats in the European elections this weekend. The Russian government has also been propping up Marine Le Pen and the far-right racist National Front Party in France, which is also poised to win tons of seats this weekend. There are open questions under investigation in Britain as to possible Russian support for the funders of Brexit and for the ongoing Brexit uprising in the UK. I mean, all of these far-right, anti-immigrant, anti-Europe groups are poised to do very well in these elections that started today and that are going to go over the next four days. In Italy, in France, in Austria in Germany, in Hungary, in the UK. And all of them are supported by Russia in one way or another. Uh, For all or most of them, the feeling is also mutual. They also support Russia. Uh, Here's a picture of the head of the League Party in Italy sitting in the European Parliament wearing a Vladimir Putin T-shirt. The creepy American factor in all of this is that all of these far-right, anti-immigrant, anti-Europe parties that are poised to destroy the European Union from within, they are not only supported by Russia and supportive of Russia, they are also being buoyed, and to a greater or lesser extent, they're all being advised by Steve Bannon, who moved his operation to Europe after what he did here for us in 2016. So sometimes I think it, it helps us as Americans understand our own situation to take a broader lens on this stuff, right? I mean, we're still muddling our way through our own situation every day. I'm going to talk with the chairman of the Judiciary Committee in just a minute about the latest fights to try to pry loose information and documents of witnesses from this administration. We are still muddling through it. But Europe is hitting this like a wall this weekend. And this is a global thing that we are in. It's not just us. And in some places, yes, these dynamics lead to whole governments collapsing suddenly and in shame and disgrace. And in other cases, that doesn't happen. In other cases, it results in previously unabashed not only making it into power, but clinging to it. We've got a lot to get to tonight, but there's a lot going on. But man, this is no time to check out. Your country needs you. 
Stay with us. Hey there, I'm Chris Hayes from MSNBC. Thanks for watching MSNBC on YouTube. If you want to keep up to date with the videos we're putting out, you can click subscribe just below me or click over on this list to see lots of other great videos.